Sonic Forces released in 2017 for the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and PC. It was meant to be a return to form after Sonic Lost World and Sonic Boom turned the franchise into even more of a laughingstock than it was back when 06 hit the shelves. A return to the successful boost formula only made sense, and after Sonic Mania breathed new life into the 2D games, everyone was beyond excited to play Forces. It seemed like it would be the best Sonic game in years, not only returning to the established 3D gameplay that fans were familiar with, but also bringing back classic Sonic, returning to a darker tone, and even introducing an avatar creator. It looks like this game was going to do the impossible task of pleasing the entire spectrum of Sonic fans. And then it came out. Sonic Forces has become one of the most hated games in the entire series, with people from all sides of the fandom lamenting its overuse of scripted sequences, half-baked story, and woefully short length. But were we too hard on Forces? Have we been overlooking a hidden gem all this time? <laughs> Buckle up everyone, because this is going to be a rocky ride. This is my review of Sonic Forces. Sonic gets a transmission from Tails that some city is under attack by the evil forces of Eggman, so he zooms over there to stop him. There, he not only finds Eggman, but also Metal Sonic, Chaos, Shadow, and Zavik all seemingly working for him again, and a mysterious new character named Infinite. He, along with the returning baddies, kicks Sonic's butt, allowing Eggman to successfully take over the world for the first time in the entire series. We then cut to six months later, where a few familiar Sonic characters have teamed up to form a resistance, and wait! Is that Chaz the Nuclear Cheetah from Nuclear Cheetah, the game that I'm working on that currently has a demo out on itch.io that you can try right now, link in the description? <laughs> Well, technically yes, but more specifically, this is the Avatar character, which we'll talk about later. Anyway, our Avatar rescues Sonic, who did not die, and now they have to work together with the Resistance to overthrow the Eggman Empire. As the game progresses, we learn more about Infinite and a mysterious gem called the Phantom Ruby that allows it to shift reality. This has various effects throughout the story, the two most notable ones being the ability to make clones, which is why characters like Shadow and Chaos are working with Eggman again, and the ability to affect other dimensions, inadvertently bringing back classic Sonic. There's a lot of details I glossed over, but that's the gist of the story in Sonic Forces. It's certainly more ambitious than it was in Lost World, justifying the amount of cutscenes this time. Credit where it's due, this concept has a lot of potential. Unfortunately though, there's even more problems here than in the previous game, so let's talk about them. Pontac and Graf return one final time for Sonic Forces, though from my understanding they were only in charge of writing for the English localization and not the actual plot itself itself, which was handled in-house as Sega this time. Pontaf's influence must have rubbed off on Sonic Team though, because the characterization and dialogue here is as awful as ever. For the fifth freaking game in a row, they've massacred my boy Tails. Ever since Unleashed, he's been a complete coward, relegated to providing exposition instead of actually being involved in the action. In fact, it's for this very reason that Sonic is even defeated in the first place, because instead of helping him fight, he just sits here behind a rock and watches his best friend presumably die. Die. The bad characterization doesn't end with the pre-existing cast, extending also to Infinite. I swear I thought Zavik was the most square, boring, generically evil villain I had ever seen in a Sonic game, but no, Infinite easily takes the cake. He's edgy for edginess' sake, and all of his dialogue can be boiled down to, You're pathetic and I'm not. The characters aren't the only thing that were butchered here though, we also have retcons, a lot of them being completely pointless. The most infamous of these is when Tails refers to classic Sonic as being from another dimension. What? Why? In Generations, he was from the past, and it's not like that would have been incompatible with the story they were trying to tell here. It's explained that the Phantom Ruby affects other dimensions, but they could have just as easily said that it affected the flow of time instead. Another big problem with the story is how it's paced. Minor exposition that could have been delivered through offhand dialogue gets full-on cutscenes, while major story events like Eggman taking over are explained through simple text crawls. You'd think the Resistance discovering that Sonic is alive after six months of hopelessness would be a big deal worthy of a full-on cutscene, but instead this is how the game presents it. I've just received some incredible news! Sonic is alive! 
No way. Not only is this a bizarre and anticlimactic way of revealing what should be a major turning point for the story, but the characters also react to it as if they just heard the ice cream truck outside. It reminds me of how Sonic reacted to Shadow being alive in Heroes. This inconsistent pacing and presentation of story events affects the entire game in a really weird and unsatisfying way. When you beat a batch of levels, this meter will pop up showing what percent of the world is left to take back from Eggman. This by itself is a great idea, giving tangible and measurable feedback that reinforces forces the amount of progress you've made, but then later on, the game completely ruins it by making it go up by like 40% every time. Towards the beginning, it went up by much less than that, making it seem like you're in for a grand adventure, but then the pace starts going a million miles an hour in the second half and the whole thing's done before you can even process it. There's a lot of other miscellaneous gripes I have with the story and forces, such as modern Sonic being completely fine despite supposedly being tortured for six months straight, but if I talked about all of them, this video would end up being 10 hours long. There's just so many problems that add up to way more than the sum of their parts, completely ruining what should have been a great return to form for Sonic stories. Unlike the story itself, the cutscenes are somewhat improved from Lost World, sporting better lighting and shot composition. The animation itself hasn't changed a bit though, with the characters still moving stiffly, emoting exclusively with their mouths and eyelids, and lacking any dynamic poses. The voice acting has seen some improvement though. While I'll never understand Sega's insistence on keeping Roger Craig Smith around, this is easily his best performance as Sonic for a mainline game in my opinion. While I still think this casting choice was the voice acting equivalent of shoving a square peg into a round hole, I do appreciate how much energy he gives the character this time. Out of all the Sonic games I've played that have Roger as Sonic, this is the one where I was least distracted by it. The rest of the cast do an okay job too, and while I don't have much to say about most of their performances, it wouldn't be a Spotman video if I didn't shout out Mike Pollock, so good job Mike Pollock, you're awesome at your job. The presentation in Sonic Forces is really solid when it comes to the visuals. The environments do retain some of the simple geometry from Lost World, but they're rendered with much better lighting and materials this time. This was the first Sonic game to use Hedgehog Engine 2, and it certainly makes a good first impression. Unfortunately, Sonic Forces doesn't have much in terms of variety when it comes to the environments, and many of them are recycled from previous games. Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Death Egg, I mean come on, out of all the established locales from the series, they really win with the ones that we've already seen in both Generations and Mania? I get that they wanted to cash in on nostalgia, but even then there's loads of interesting zones in the Gen Genesis games that they could have pulled from instead. What about Marble Zone, or Aquatic Ruin, or Hydrocity, or Hydro City? Even if they absolutely had to reuse these overdone areas we've seen a million times, they still could have done more to make them visually unique in this game. Eggman has taken over after all, so why not give these the Sonic CD bad future treatment? Instead of Green Hill having sand waterfalls or whatever, why not have it be on fire like Angel Island in Sonic 3? Instead of retreading the same parts of Chemical Plant we've been time and time again, why not have us explore those mysterious buildings that were always in the background. As it is, the way these are implemented is just so boring. That's not to say Forces is completely devoid of interesting environments though. Unlike Lost World, it has at least a few of its own. My favorite one is easily a Metropolitan Highway. While the whole futuristic city thing had been done before in Sonic Heroes, Forces does its own take on the idea and it looks really cool. I wish the devs focused more on designing fresh and new areas like this instead of remaking ones we've already seen for the fifth time. The character designs are another thing that's continued to stagnate, though they did update Sonic's model to have shorter quills and a lighter blue than before. I really hate how this looks. Classic Sonic wasn't light blue originally either, but it made sense to give him a different color in generations to make it easier to differentiate him from modern Sonic, but now they're both light blue, so what's the point? It's not even a flattering color for him if you ask me, it just looks wrong. That's the visuals covered, but there's also a bit to talk about in the sound department. To start with the negatives this time, I do think the sound design has seen a bit of a downgrade. I haven't really talked about the sound design in these games for a while now, but the early boost games had really punchy metallic sound effects whenever you defeated enemies, followed by some super satisfying explosions. Forces, on the other hand, suffers the same problem as Adventure 1 in Heroes. The explosions are so quiet that defeating enemies doesn't give you the feedback that it should. I know this probably sounds like a minor nitpick, but boosting into enemies and doing homing attack chains is something you do pretty frequently in this game, so it's virtually impossible to ignore, at least for me. The soundtrack though? I might be in the minority here, but I think Sonic Forces 
references as one of the best OSTs in the whole series. Modern Sonic's levels combine the established rock vibe with some cool sounding synths, the avatar stages feature vocal tracks with EDM and dubstep influences, the cutscenes have an outstanding orchestral score, and while Faded Hills is, uh... Faded Hills, the rest of Classic Sonic's tracks are also solid, using a sound font that sounds like it could realistically be produced by an actual Sega Genesis. I hear a lot of people criticize the soundtrack in this game for being too synthy, but I never really understood that complaint. Sonic games have always had a pop influence, especially the classic games, which pretty much all use synths for their soundtracks. Maybe it's just me, but the way Forces marries that idea with contemporary genres all while maintaining the rock style that has persisted ever since the adventure game just continues to resonate with me. This is one of those soundtracks like Sonic Adventure 2 or Sonic Colors that just has such a distinct sound to it. When you hear a song from Sonic Forces, you immediately know it's from Sonic Forces, and I always appreciate when a game has a unique musical identity like this. I'd say the presentation in Sonic Forces is pretty darn solid. I wish there were more original environments, and I think the animation and sound design is a bit of a downgrade, but with that aside, this is both a nice looking and nice sounding game. This all brings us to, of course, the gameplay, and there is a lot to unpack here. The world map returns once again from colors in Lost World, and progression is still perfectly linear. You beat a level, maybe watch a cutscene or fight a boss, then move on to the next one. Unlike those games though, Sonic Forces marks the return of multiple playable characters. We have Modern Sonic, Classic Sonic, and the Avatar, all with their own separate play styles, along with the occasional levels that have the Avatar team up with Modern Sonic. The way the game sets this up is similar to how a single campaign plays out in Sonic Adventure 2. Instead of going through the story multiple times as separate characters, Forces simply bounces between each character's perspective throughout, and makes you play all of the levels in a set order. And, in one of the few genuine improvements this game makes over its predecessors, you won't find yourself going through several levels in a row as the same character. Most of the time you'll play a modern Sonic level, then an Avatar level, then classic Sonic, then back to modern. So you know what time it is, it's time once again to bust out the the three staples of Sonic Excellence. For those of you who are new, these are the basic principles that I look for in a character's playstyle in a Sonic game. 1. Essential Sonic staples should be present. These include rings, springs, robotic enemies, etc. 2. Replayability should be encouraged through design. A good Sonic gameplay style should have a high skill ceiling for mastering the character's moveset and or challenging levels that become more fun the more you play them. And finally, 3. The character's central attribute should be important. By central attribute, I mean the core of the character's design. For example, Sonic is a hedgehog, so his gameplay should place emphasis on his ability to roll into a ball. Note that these don't necessarily denote a good playstyle period, but rather a baseline that distincts a Sonic game from any other generic platformer. Now, with these in mind, let's get into it. The game starts us out with modern Sonic, so let's do the same here. One of the reasons that Sonic Forces was so anticipated was the return of the boost formula from Unleashed, Colors, and Generations. While that formula never perfectly met my three staples, it was still a blast, especially in Colors and Generations. So how does modern Sonic and Forces stack up against those games? Well, not great. You'll recall that Sonic Lost World completely overhauled Sonic's moveset, replacing the movement engine from the original Hedgehog Engine games in favor of something entirely new. You may also recall that I absolutely despised the way Sonic controlled in that game due to the complete absence of the physics and momentum that had persisted throughout the series up to that point, Sonic 06 notwithstanding, of course. Well, in a completely baffling decision that I will never understand, Sonic Team decided that this was the movement engine engine from which they would build their glorious renaissance of Boost Sonic upon. And it's awful. Let's start with the positives though. Sonic can now retain a boost when he jumps, allowing him to do these long dives, which is pretty fun to do in certain levels. And that's it. Modern Sonic feels just as clunky to control as he did in Lost World, if not even more. They did at least try to make him feel a little closer to how the boost games did, with his movement no longer being locked to eight directions, nor moving slower sideways and diagonally, but it's their attempt at trying to simulate momentum that completely destroys the game feel. Now when I say momentum here, I'm not referring to the 360 degree pinball physics from games past. I'm talking basic, horizontal, acceleration, and deceleration. 
situation, like a Mario game. Forces tries to simulate this, but it does it in a really unnatural way, having you start slow and then suddenly jerking you into a full sprint after a few seconds. It reminds me most of Super Mario World, which also had weird sudden acceleration like this, but it's not nearly as bad in that game as it is here. This, combined with the lack of air control, makes platforming feel needlessly janky, even ruining the 2D sections, which I've never had any complaints with any of the previous Boost games. With that said though, you're not going to be doing a whole lot of actual platforming as modern Sonic, and that leads me to my other big complaint. Sonic Forces abuses automation. Sure, nearly every previous 3D Sonic game occasionally used scripted sequences for spectacle's sake, but the modern Sonic levels and forces take this several steps too far. Virtually the entire level automatically steers you onto a spline that you can't break out of unless you come to a complete stop. I imagine this was done in an attempt to disguise how bad the controls really are, but this removes so much agency on the player's part that it turns the boost formula from a reaction-based platformer to a glorified walking simulator, or running simulator, I guess. The game hands out boost wisps like candy and constantly expects you to hold square for the entire level, plowing through everything with no effort whatsoever. The level length, or lack thereof, exacerbates this issue. There's nothing inherently wrong with having bite-sized levels, but it becomes a huge problem when a majority of that is just holding a single button and watching Sonic go. Playing a 1-2 to two minute stage isn't so bad if I'm actually playing the game, but if I'm only controlling the character for a third of it at most, then I I'm inevitably going to feel underwhelmed. It makes these stages feel much shorter than they actually are. So how does modern Sonic perform under the three Sonic staples? Number one is Med, if it even needs to be said at this point. Rings, Springs, Loop-de-Loops, Badniks, they're all here. Requirement number two, on the other hand, is where this gameplay style quickly begins to fall apart. I've said before that the S ranks in Sonic Generations are way too easy, but in Sonic Forces you don't even have to try. The entire level's already automated, so there's not much of a skill ceiling to reach this time around. And number three, take a guess, take a wild guess. No. Not one single bit. Sonic's ability to roll into a ball was already neglected in the previous Boost games, and Forces is no exception to this rule. Even then, those games at least retained the 360 degree momentum from the adventure games. Sure, it wasn't utilized as much, but at least it was still there. But Sonic Forces is built on an engine made for magnetizing Sonic to whatever floor triangle he's closest to, and no amount of automation can disguise that fact. That's only one out of three staples then, just like Lost World. So. Who do we have next? Wait. Oh no. Classic Sonic really sucks, or at least the Sonic forces he does. He was just fine in Mania. What happened here? Well, you can probably guess. Using an engine with no momentum to recreate a gameplay style that relies almost entirely on momentum was, shall we say, a bold choice, and it doesn't take an astrophysicist to figure out why this doesn't work. Like modern Sonic, classic Sonic's levels have a lot of automation, and you can tell it's the only thing that's propelling him through these half-pipes and loop-de-loops. The best part is that rolling, you know, classic's whole shtick, completely breaks some of these sections, and not in a good way. The drop dash from Sonic Mania returns here, and like the spin dash in Lost World, it seems that most of these levels were designed with spamming it in mind. When you're not drop dashing, you're partaking in the most boring, blocky, and tedious 2D platforming I've ever seen in a Sonic game. And again, like modern Sonic, the wonky physics make it way more annoying than it should be. So how does classic Sonic perform under the three staples? Of course he's here for nostalgia's sake, so all of the essentials you'd expect in a Sonic game are here once more, including iconic power-ups such as the speed shoes, invincibility, and the shield. Yet again though, he completely fails at number 2. At best, these levels pretty much play themselves and hand you the S rank without much effort. At worst, they're simply so boring that you won't find yourself eager to replay them even if you somehow didn't get the S rank the first time. Number 3 gets a half pass from me. Yes, rolling is technically important. You need the drop dash and or the spin dash to get through certain automated segments that have several enemies lined up in a row to roll into. However, the lack of any actual Sonic physics turns rolling into a ball from a fun way of maintaining speed to a lackluster attack that only exists to try and gaslight you into believing that this really is classic Sonic and not Santiago. 1.5 out of 3.
If there's any reason to bother with Sonic Forces, it's probably the Avatar. The customization seems pretty bare bones at first, only allowing you to choose from a handful of species and a few colors. As you progress though, the game absolutely showers you with new cosmetics, and by the end you might even end up with something you're pretty happy with. Or you'll end up with whatever this thing's supposed to be. Give him a name in the comments if you want. This customization carries over into the gameplay as well, in the form of Wisps. Again, it's not really explained in-game why they're even here, but whatever, Lost World didn't do that either. Unlike previous games where you can use any Wisp when you encounter it in a level, Sonic Forces requires you to have a specific gun, or Wispin as they're called, that's only compatible with a particular kind. It sort of rubs me the wrong way that we're using these poor aliens as ammo since the whole point of them in colors was to save them from being used as that very thing, but again, whatever, I guess. This is by far the best part of these stages, though like a lot of things in this game, it reeks of mis potential. Some wisps, especially lightning and burst, are helpful for finding quicker routes through levels, but most of the others are only really helpful for defeating enemies, something you're probably not going to have a hard time with either way. When it comes to the general gameplay itself, the Avatar suffers from the same pitfalls as the two Sonics, and of course I mean that literally. Unlike those playstyles though, the Avatar doesn't have a boost or drop dash to help pick up speed, so if there's platforming to be done, chances are you're not going to be able to brute force your way past it. I would say say that this is a good thing, since it means there's less automation, but since the physics are still borked, I'd almost rather the gameplay itself. A few levels see the Avatar teaming up with Sonic in a similar fashion to Sonic Heroes, and these are debatably the best stages in the entire game. You now have access to Sonic's double jump and boost, while still being able to use the Wisps to take shortcuts. These also feature the double boost, one of the most heavily marketed and memed on parts of this game. Unfortunately, this is a nothing mechanic. All you do is spam the square button for a few seconds, then watch Sonic in your OC blast through a large chunk of the stage with no further input required. This might have been more interesting if it functioned like the special moves in Shadow the Hedgehog, where you could save it and strategically use it anywhere in the stage, but as it's implemented here, you can only do it when the game makes you, so it's not much more than a glorified quick time event. Despite these shortcomings though, the Avatar surprisingly performs the best under the three staples out of any other playstyle in this game. As always, essential elements of the series are present, so there's not much to say there. When it comes to the second staple, I'm giving this one a half point. While the S-Ranks are still far too easy for a grand majority of these levels, revisiting them with different Wispins does add at least some variety in terms of alternate routes, though it definitely could have been fleshed out a lot more. The Avatar aces the third staple though. This character's whole identity is shaped by the player, which is expressed yet again through the Wispins. While these don't encourage replayability as much as I would have liked, they do allow players to pick and choose what kind of attacks they want their original character to have, whether that's a lightning whip, flamethrower, drill, etc. 2.5 out of 3 staples is a good score, and while it certainly doesn't ace it, the Avatar is the one place out in this game that passes the Sonic gameplay test. Like I've said in past videos, classic Sonic bosses set themselves apart from other platformers with a simple design philosophy. There's no limit to how many times you can damage the boss while it's vulnerable, only the amount of time that it is. The past couple of games have completely ignored this approach with vastly different degrees of success. So how does Sonic Forces fare? It actually fares really well. Like really well. Aside from a few outliers, such as the one you do as Classic Sonic or the Zavik fight at the beginning that makes a bad first impression, a majority of the boss fights in Sonic Forces not only follow the classic philosophy to some degree, they're also genuinely fun for the most part. The best of these are easily the few battles you'll have with Infinite. The first one is reminiscent of a lot of the fights in the previous boost games, but this time taking place on a snake, allowing you to run on all sides of it. As long as you're fast enough, you can attack Infinite at any time, and it's really satisfying this way. The one you do as the Avatar also follows this approach, though in a very different setting. This one takes place in 2D, requiring you to dodge obstacles while waiting for Infinite to become vulnerable, and wailing on him as much as possible, as fast as possible. Aside from the inherent problems with the character physics making it difficult to avoid his projectiles, this is a well-designed fight. Most of the boss fights and forces are designed this way, aside from the outliers I mentioned before, which use a Mario-like approach in a frankly boring fashion. Overall though, these were a surprising 
amazing breath of fresh air in an otherwise horribly designed game. What I don't like about these bosses is who you're actually fighting. While the game makes it look like it has a solid rogues gallery in the first cutscene, in reality you only get to fight two of the returning baddies. One fight with Zavok and one fight with Metal Sonic. We don't get a battle with Shadow or Chaos in this game. And sure, we already fought them in Generations, but what's the point of bringing them back a third time if you're not even going to actually use them? With all of that said, let's talk about the final boss. Spoiler alert, skip here if you don't want to see him. After a final fight with him, Infinite is unceremoniously vaporized, which for all I know is what happened to the Deadly Six too. Unfortunately for the Resistance though, Eggman has one last trick up his sleeve, that being the newest iteration of the Death Egg robot. Modern, Classic, and the Avatar now have to team up to overcome this one last challenge. This is a three-phase fight, each phase having you play as a different character. Classics is probably the weakest, only requiring you to hit these rocks back, much like his only other boss. The Avatars is a bit more interesting, having you wait for a specific attack and then strike the boss as many times as you can, similar to the infinite fight from before. This phase does have a really annoying attack that's impossible to see coming if you don't know about it, but it only killed me once in this playthrough. The final phase is when things start to get interesting. For the first and only time, we get to play as Modern Sonic, Classic Sonic, and the Avatar all at the same time, in a sequence that's reminiscent of the Wisp armor from Colors. I'll admit that I do wish they got a little more creative with the actual gameplay of this fight, but between the awesome spectacle and the epic soundtrack, it's a pretty solid climax. What's not a solid climax is this game's ending. After the Death Egg robot is defeated, Classic Sonic goes home, Sonic talks about how the Resistance is going to repair the world, but the game doesn't actually show them doing that, Tails preaches about friendship, and Sonic and Chaz part ways. Credits. Sonic Forces is one of those games that I hate to hate. The concept of exploring a world that Eggman managed to successfully take over was a great idea, and to its credit, there is a bit of charm here that occasionally manages to seep through the cracks. But this game is too often stifled by a myriad of baffling design decisions, whether it's the insistence on keeping terrible writers, the unwillingness to design interesting new environments, or most egregiously, the awful decision to try and salvage an inherently flawed game engine. The developers clearly lacked good time management, focusing on polishing superficial things like the graphics instead of making the actual game fun to play. And ultimately, we ended up with something that not only lacked content, but also spoiled what could have been a genuinely good experience. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my other Sonic content and subscribe for more video game content just like this. You can also become a member for just a dollar per month to get your name in the credits, exclusive emojis, and permanent access to my Discord server. But either way, stay tuned, thanks for watching, and as always, enjoy life.